Good morning and welcome to worship at First United Presbyterian Church in Fayetteville, Arkansas. It is a delight to have you with us this morning and we thank you whenever you make time to um, come to worship as we live stream or to watch it later. We've had a few technical difficulties this morning and so we thank you for coming back to this live stream and hearing it at a later time. We are continuing to look at Into Your Hands, I Commit My Spirit, Jesus' Words on the Cross. And as we move toward Good Friday, we are thinking about other ways that hands show up in the New Testament. So we've seen withered hands and humble hands and healing hands. And today we're going to look at that passage about a hand in the sand and contemplate what it is that Jesus is telling the people as he pronounces forgiveness. In two weeks, it will be Palm Sunday, March 28th. The season is moving quickly. The day before, at 1.30, we'll have a Palm Sunday parade here and a scavenger hunt for Holy Week symbols. It's for anyone who wants to come. And we'll make a video from that, and you will see that video on Palm Sunday in worship. Between Palm Sunday and Easter, there are two times that you can come for your communion elements. The first is exactly the time I told you just a minute ago. Uh, you can either participate in the parade, or you can just drive through and get your palm fronds and your communion elements, and those will be available um, outside our church buildings, just as they are usually, Saturday, the 27th of March, 1.30 to 2.30. And then there'll be a second time, the evening before Monday, Thursday, Wednesday, 5.30 to 6.30. This will all be written down for you, too, if you're a member, or you can send us a, a note on the website, and we will get the information to you if you'd like to participate. Two communion services coming, Monday, Thursday, and Easter Sunday. We hope to have uh, Easter communion services um, in person, outdoors. That's what the session has voted, that we can spread out on the courtyard. And so that's our intention, weather permitting. And then there will also be an 11 o'clock live stream, not in person, but live streamed 11 o'clock. Outside the white bins at Calvin Building, there are a number of things that might be of interest to you. One is these days. Oh, some of you have asked about the devotionals, and so they're there. The purple bracelets are still there. The annual report in hard copy, including the financial pieces, are there. Uh, the printed directories for nominating are there. And if you would like a printed directory, all you need to do is call the church office and we'll make sure that you have one in hard copy too. We had a wonderful time on Wednesday evening with our first All Aboard congregational meeting. We had a lot of good feedback from individuals and from groups. And we will keep building on that as we think about our 10-year goals. Uh, we are sailing toward the year 2030. And we'll be on board again on Zoom on April 21st. So you'll have another chance to help with this. You may also call the church office if you would like a hard copy and to be able to give us that kind of written feedback. We would simply like you to send it back by April 21st so that we can include it in all the gathering of information. Uh, there'll be some things in the prayer list that will be of importance to you, some joyful pieces and um, some hospitalizations, just things that you'll want to be praying about. And also, uh, deacons meet on Tuesday evening, and the session meets tonight. So please keep those in mind, um, and we're glad that uh, we can worship together today, uh, even though you will be seeing this at a time later than 11 o'clock. Let's begin with our opening prayer. Lord, as we come into your presence, we are all too aware of how far short we fall of your good purposes for our lives. Still we come seeking your grace, and we ask you to come to us, tuning our hearts to the true, clear grace notes that reassure us that nothing we have done, 
and nothing we have failed to do can ever separate us from your love in Jesus Christ our Lord. This morning, free us from sin and guilt that we might rejoice in your presence. Amen. My name is Evan. And I'm Mason. Today I will lead us in Mason will act as the congregation. That means when Mason speaks, we invite you to join us. And please join us in the call to worship from Psalm 32. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in those whose spirit and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity, I said, I confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At the, a time of distress, the rush of the mighty waters shall not reach them. You're a, hiding pl you're a hiding place for me. You protect me from trouble. You, you surround me with glad cries of deliverance. Now please join us in singing hymn 475, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
morning, everybody. My name is Jacob. I'm one of the directors for youth and young adult ministry here at First United Presbyterian Church. And I'm glad to be with you in worship this morning, even over video. You can see that I've got my purple wristband for the month of Lent on. I know many of you are wearing those yourselves. We've come to the point in our worship service called the Prayer of Confession. This is a moment where we admit together that we're not perfect. In fact, that we're sinners and that we need God's forgiveness and mercy. Today, in the scripture reading, we're going to hear a story that contrasts Jesus' worldview with a very different kind of worldview, a worldview based on judgment and based on the law, based on pointing fingers, shaking fingers, and saying, you did wrong, you did wrong. Too often, that's the worldview we have, isn't it? We point fingers. We say, you did wrong. We judge others. Well, I'm going to ask you to join me in our prayer of confession, and we'll confess that sin as well as other sins together. I hope you'll pray with me. I'll leave a little time at the end for you to pray your own personal prayer of confession. Let's pray. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And I'll give you a few moments. Pray for yourself a personal prayer of confession. Amen. Well, in the same story, we're going to hear not only the worldview that's kind of contrasted with who Jesus is, but also what Jesus believes about judgment, about pointing fingers. You see, Jesus' worldview is different than that. This is Jesus who demands forgiveness, not judgment, who demands mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus' love for us in spite of our judgmental attitudes, in spite of all the ways that we do wrong to others, in spite of all our pointing fingers, Jesus' love for us remains. His forgiveness for us remains. This is a free gift for you and for me. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
everyone. I'm Ross. And I'm Solomon. And this guy is Oliver. <laughs> Oliver is crazy! And God's grace really is limitless. Um, we struggle as humans to even comprehend it. Um, and it's impossible for us to truly uh, equal His grace. But we do have a new and fresh opportunity every time we wake up. And we have the best example in Jesus Christ for us to live by and for us to strive for each day to get a little closer. Um, my name is Solomon. It is. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you, buddy. Thanks, guys. Wasn't it fun to see some of the children of our church this morning in our videos? We really miss you here, and we hope it won't be too much longer before we can start seeing each other again. We're going to be thinking about that some today. Well, today I want us to, uh, I want to ask you if you ever have done anything that you wished you hadn't. Has there ever been a time when you did something that you wish you hadn't? When I was growing up, I had a sister and a brother, and sometimes I was really mean to them. And I think about it, and I wish I had been nicer, but I had been mean. And sometimes I had friends that I felt jealous of. Do you ever have a friend that you felt jealous of? And sometimes I would tell a lie, maybe not so much a lie, but I would make these big stories, like I'd make them bigger than life, and they were so big that they were no longer true stories. So he called that exaggerating the truth. We all do things that God doesn't want us to do, and the Bible calls that sin, okay? You've probably heard that word, sin. Jacob talked a bit about it as we were confessing our sins. And today I brought along this picture. I hope you can see it. Because when we talk in the Bible about sin, we talk about a target and missing the mark. Now, I don't know if you throw these kinds of arrows or darts, but the point is to try to hit the center because that's what's intended. And the Ten Commandments help us to try to hit the center and do what God wants. Sometimes maybe you've been at Chuck E. Cheese, and when you get there, they have those games where you th try to get the ball into the hole, into the hole, and sometimes you miss, sometimes you don't get it, and you get fewer points or something like that. You've had that experience, right? So when we have a target like this, we try to hit the center. The sin in, sin in the Bible is missing the mark. The word that's used there means missing the mark, hitting the target here, or hitting over here, or no, not being anywhere near the target. So the story that we're looking at today has to do uh, with a woman who didn't follow all of the Ten Commandments. And so the people around her were upset with her, and all they could see was her sin. And when Jesus met with them, he um, drew something in the sand with his hand. You know, we're talking about hands. Brienne got us talking about hands. So he puts his hand in the sand and he writes something. And I don't know what he wrote. I'm not sure what he wrote. But I think it had to do somehow with this word. I'm going to put it on here. And then maybe you can see it. 
I think it had to do with this word, forgive. I think it had to do with the way that Jesus loves us and cares about us and how we can always be forgiven of the things we do. I used to have to um, write to my parents and tell them why I had done something. Or my mom would march me over to the neighbor and have me apologize and to say, I'm sorry. And Jesus wants us to forgive people. He wants us to say, I'm sorry. But what's so important here is the way that he forgives us. He takes our sin away. And so our sin separates us from God, so we can't feel close. But when we say, I'm sorry, or we say, forgive me, or we say, help me, then God forgives us. And so the big word that I want you to think about as we look at our hands is forgiveness. Let's pray together. We come to you, we come to you, to learn of your love, to learn of your love. Please forgive us. Please forgive us of all our sins. Of all our sins. Amen. Amen.
Please join me in prayer. God of grace, by your Spirit, show us again our complete dependence on your grace and your forgiveness. Extend it to us in Jesus' determination to sacrifice his life for us. Grant us the grace to extend that same mercy and forgiveness to those around us. Our scripture for today is from the 7th and 8th chapters of John. It's the extremely familiar and deeply loved story of the woman who was caught in the midst of adultery and then Jesus in the situation extends God's grace and God's love to her. Then each of them went home while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. Now what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, He bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. I want to make a comment here. As you can see already, there are literally hundreds of artistic depictions of this story of Jesus that have been made throughout the history of the church. And it stands to reason. For many of us, it's an all-time favorite that speaks deeply to us of who God is. It reminds us of how we experience the true nature of God by beholding God in the person of Jesus, His Son, But I want to make an important point about the postures in this story and what they reflect about how Jesus reflects God's attitude towards us all, regardless of our gender or our cultural background or our race or our caste or even our behavior. Almost all the images that I could find about this story either depict Jesus standing and the woman kneeling, like you see here in this picture, or rarely both of them standing, or once in a while Jesus riding with his hand in the sand and the woman stretched out on the ground or crouching near him. 
But as you look carefully again at this slide and the wording at the end of verse 9 that's there on the slide, you can see the irony of those images and the beauty of what actually happened. Jesus was actually the one on his knees, having just written in the sand, and the woman was the one left standing. That's what the verse says. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. It's a beautiful image of the stark contrast between the arrogant way the woman was treated by the self-righteous, hypocritical scribes and Pharisees and the humble, respectful, countercultural way that Jesus engaged with her as a woman and as a human being created in the image of God. And I noticed that, and I started searching, and finally I found an image that seems to reflect what the text actually says. Jesus kneeling, and the woman standing. Now continuing with this last beautiful summary of the entire story. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and for now on, do not keep on sinning. This is one of those unforgettable universal stories that Jesus tells that speaks God's word of grace and forgiveness across all times, all cultures, all languages, and all human conditions. Scholars are certain that it was added into the Gospel of John later, after the main body of the Gospel was written. But it's almost impossible to hear it and not know immediately that it's a genuine memory of a real encounter that Jesus actually had. It has its own intrinsic power, doesn't it? And there's little doubt that it resonates with every Christian's sense of who Jesus was and what he said and did, and then vicariously who God is and what God says and does. It's likely to have been a free-floating story that the people who were there remembered so vividly and resonated with so deeply that they passed it down orally over the years until it finally took its honored place in the eighth chapter of the fourth gospel. If you're like me, it's one of your very favorite stories of what Jesus did and said. It gives us a beautiful, exciting narrative glimpse of the core message of the fourth gospel that Jesus came not to condemn the world but that through the world but that the world might be saved through him by God's grace through faith and that's John 3:17 with a little bit of Paul added in what do you think Jesus was writing on the ground was he writing sins that he knew all of us commit that no one could deny having committed at some point? That certainly would have been something that might have helped the scribes and Pharisees change their attitude. Was he writing sins that were taking place at that very moment and they were able to see what he was writing? Whatever the answer Somehow, the self-righteous scribes and Pharisees had a kind of epiphany of some sort because of Jesus' words and the hypocrisy of the situation. And that speaks well for them. Maybe he wrote about judging others. Maybe he wrote about a lack of compassion. Maybe he wrote about self-righteousness or self-centeredness or a lack of love. They came to trap Jesus but they ended up listening to God speak through him. Or at the very least, somehow God did speak to them in this situation as they heard it reframed by the Jesus that they had come to trap and have arrested. I want us to think for just a minute about three things that are important to notice in this story. First of all, 
I want us to notice that Jesus is forcing the scribes and the Pharisees to redefine their sense of what sin is. We learn from Jesus in this story that sin isn't something some people do and some people don't. It's a universal condition that affects every one of us. St. Augustine and later Martin Luther talked about the core of sin as the soul curved inward. The condition of instinctively putting our own needs before the needs of others, unless we're transformed by God's grace and the power of God's Spirit. We're using a book right now by Alan Lewis as we prepare for Holy Week and Easter in the Thoughtful Christians discussion that happens at 9.30 every Sunday on Zoom 1, and you're invited to participate in that Zoom. And this wonderful book talks about the way our shared tendency towards self-centeredness actually connects us all together in our mutual need for grace and our mutual need for a power greater than ourselves. We can't put ourselves above others. My sins may be different from your sins, but they're sins. They may even cause more damage to others, my sins, or they may have greater consequences than yours do. But we all share the universal human condition of falling short of God's good purpose for us. The second thing I want us to notice in this passage is that Jesus refuses to get caught up in the same sins of self-righteousness and judgment and lack of compassion that the accusers are showing to this unnamed woman. Instead, he focuses attention and his concern completely on her, protecting her, defending her, seeing her as a human being created in God's image, embodying God's grace by extending forgiveness to her. And the third thing I want us to notice is that our first instinct to right the wrongs in the world by pointing them out and condemning them isn't the way of God in Christ. Jacob talked about that in uh, his introduction to the confession of sin. Think of how prevalent the tendency is in our culture to point fingers and to think we can right the wrongs in the world by pointing them out and condemning them. We see it on both sides of the political right and left in our culture wars. We do it at work. We do it in our friendships. We do it with our brothers and sisters if you're growing up in a family. We do it in our marriages. We do it in the way we react to our children as parents when they get out of line. We do it when one or both of our parents have caused us unbearable pain and we spend the rest of our lives struggling with resentment over what they've done or what they've failed to do for us. The wrongs in the world and in our relationships are reversed, not by pointing them out and condemning them in others, but by showing grace and forgiveness and mercy and compassion by standing in solidarity with sinners because we all share the same condition. It's always we, never you. I've developed a consistent response when someone says to me they're not interested in church because the church is full of hypocrites. I say, I'm sorry, but when I'm honest with myself, I'm a hypocrite. And that's exactly why church is so important to me. I'd be even worse if I didn't go to church. And then I wink and I say, there's always room for one more. The scribes and Pharisees were hypocrites because in their pride they excluded themselves from the common fallen condition of all human beings. They regarded themselves as exempt, as above others. But we're all hypocrites. And only when we honestly admit that Can we embrace the grace of God that extends unlimited forgiveness to us along with the Spirit, who's the power for us to be changed? Jesus faced hypocrisy from the scribes and Pharisees and a woman whose life was out 
of control. Two different kinds of sin. One, hypocrisy. The other, a woman whose life is out of her control. And both of these were different manifestations of our shared condition of sin. But Jesus' response to both in this story was to show grace and forgiveness and mercy and compassion. He didn't condemn even the Pharisees for condemning her. He just said things in a way that helped them see what they were doing wrong and made them walk away in shame at the way they had treated her. Only the person who's willing to commit to admit our deep dependence on God's grace and power can receive it. If we're self-righteous, we exclude ourselves, even if we think we're excluding others. As we think about our response to sin, we just need to look at the pattern of Jesus in this story. And this is for us to apply to our own lives now as we hear God's word in our world, in our time, in our relationships, in our places of work, in our families, in our schools. The first step is to recognize our own complete dependence on God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's mercy, and compassion in awareness of the many ways that we fall short, that I fall short. And then the second step is to recognize the image of God in those whose lives are out of control and those who are judgmental, and to extend God's grace and forgiveness and mercy and compassion to everyone in Jesus' name. Now, I know that's easier said than done, but we have an encouraging verse in Colossians. Do you remember just before COVID, we did the whole book of Colossians last January and February? And Jacob and Brianne presented it to us by memory, the whole book, and we heard it just as if it would have been read in a congregation in the first century. And one of the most beautiful verses in that whole book of Colossians says, bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. And here's the key. Just as God has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. We pray it every week, don't we? In the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. In the Gospel of Mark, which scholars agree is the earliest written account of Jesus' ministry, the only thing that Jesus says on the cross is this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? He was echoing the words of Psalm 22, when, like many of us, the psalm writer was feeling like God had completely left him, that he was utterly forsaken and abandoned. Why would Jesus say that? It's called the cry of dereliction. At the beginning of our Reformed tradition, John Calvin emphasizes that when we say Christ descended into hell in the Apostles' Creed, we're reminding ourselves that Christ willingly and lovingly chose to actually be forsaken by his Heavenly Father on that terrible Friday 2,000 years ago. Hell is ultimate separation from God, abandonment by God. Jesus descended into hell for us so that as we entrust our life and death to him, we'll never have to experience that hell, that ultimate separation. God took it upon himself. God absorbed it into the divine being of the three persons of the Trinity. And the good news of the Christian message is that God loved human creatures made in his image so much that in the person of his son, he chose to suffer that abandonment himself, to allow a breach to occur in the eternal communion of God's Trinitarian unity, so that as we place our trust in him, we can know with certainty that God will never abandon us. In his cry of dereliction on the cross, Scripture says in 2 Corinthians, and you see this on your screen, For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Our sermon series this Lent is Into Your Hands. 
These are the last words Jesus says in the account in the Gospel of Luke. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. There are four ways that human hands reflect the movement of this beautiful story of the unnamed woman who receives God's grace through her encounter with Jesus. At the beginning, the scribes and the Pharisees, as Jacob pointed out, point their fingers at the unnamed woman whose life is out of control, as if she sinned and they had the right to judge that sin because they didn't. The second movement is that Jesus writes with his finger in the sand. We don't know, but perhaps he was naming the sins that we all commit that mark our common human condition of alienation from God. And then when Jesus addresses the Pharisees, he challenges their self-righteousness in a way that forces them to stop and walk away from the judgmental drama that they had created and go home. And then finally, when he focuses on the woman, he freely and unreservedly extends God's grace, God's gracious embrace. Those movements of human hands trace the movement in our story from self-righteousness and blame and judgment to grace and forgiveness, mercy and compassion. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our affirmation of faith today comes from the Confession of 1967. This confession was written when our denomination was going through a reckoning. We were joining with another denomination, another branch of the Presbyterian Church, and figuring out how we as Christians put aside our judgment of each other and pursue uh, radical justice and equity with each other. And this affirmation of faith is all about Jesus and is in his humanity being an example for us of love and sacrifice. So let's say this together. In Jesus of Nazareth, true humanity was realized once for all. Jesus, a Palestinian Jew, lived among his own people, shared their needs, temptations, joys, and sorrows. He expressed the love of God in word and deed and became a brother to all kinds of sinful people. But his complete obedience led him into conflict with his people. His life and teaching judged their goodness, religious aspirations, and national hopes. Many rejected him and demanded his death. In giving himself freely for them, he took upon himself the judgment which under, under which we all stand convicted. God raised him from the dead, vindicated him as Messiah and Lord. The victim of sin became victor and won the victory over sin and death for all. Amen. And now let us take some time to consider how we may offer ourselves in response, in a grateful response to how God has offered himself for us. <laughs>
gracious Lord, we come before you with gratitude and praise. Every good gift has been given to us by your hand. Help us, in turn, to share what we have received as we reach out our hands to you. You are good and kind, slow to anger, full of love. You do not hold our sins against us, and you remove them as far as the east is from the west. Those are the promises of Scripture. We need constantly to hear this good news in our lives. And so as we reflect on the things that we have done and left undone, we pray that you would shower us with your loving forgiveness. Let your forgiveness overcome our mistakes, our guilt, our missteps, and set your cross before us and set us on a path of following you as you ask. The things we want to do, we often cannot do. And the things we don't want to do, we find so easy to do. Guide us as we are tempted to point our fingers at another, to sit in judgment, to be those who sit back and get a bigger perspective of the matters around us. Help us as we attempt to write in the sand and to destroy a person that we might recognize that no one is perfect. Help us to be challenged to stop in our steps and then to embrace with grace those who have been sometimes set apart from us. May we all come into one family. Help this to be true in our personal lives, in our church, in our community, in our nation, in our world. As we reflect this morning on our family as a church, we thank you for those places where we see your goodness. We rejoice with those who rejoice knowing that a new baby has been born into this church family. We rejoice when we see those people that who are stepping out to give good food to others in time of need. And to all who have stepped forward in this pandemic to volunteer, we're grateful some have done this for the first time. We've heard news, too, that some are improving with cancer treatments. We ask your healing presence for all who are in hospitals today, for those who need courage and patience and your strength, for those who contend with physical pain, and also for any in families that are carrying heavy burdens, matters of mind, body, spirit. Show us how to be companions on the road to the cross as we carry our own crosses. May we carry the crosses of others. And now we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We apologize that this service was not able to be uh, simulcasted this morning at 11. It is available now, and we're glad that you're here with us. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always.